for all three classes during the day. So the only thing I might need is batteries. The batteries here, I just replace it because I get the special. That'll be great. I mean, it might be good to permanently leave it somewhere, you know, with, uh, unless it gets thrown away, because that way, I, that's the only thing I, I conceivably run out of. So. Okay, folks, I'm not even going to ask you. I'm not even going to ask you whether you're in a group. I'll assume. Can I have your attention, please? I'll assume you'll find a group, but you know how to do it. You know how to seek people out. So, so I'm going to jump to the second question. Hey, hey. Class is starting. Who's picked a company? Okay. Still no, some hands are not up. So if you've not picked a company, come on. What are you waiting for? Hey. Get it. Uh, the sooner you can pick a company, the sooner you can start applying things. Okay. So let me start with today's uh, start of the class test. The first page I'm going to show you is a repeat of the last start of the class test, but I'm going to start with that as my launching pad. Remember the, uh, the offer I made you or, a, or an investment I offered you a dollar in cash flows every year forever? And I said, if there's uncertainty about the cash flows, you know, you, you'll have to build into the price. I know who gave me the answer, but I don't, does it, who's the one who gave me the $30? Was it was it you? You offered thirty dollars. So let's see. Let's say that was the clearing price, thirty dollars for a dollar every year in perpetuity, but with uncertainty about the dollar. Now I'm going to throw a curveball at you. Okay. It's well known that as people age, they become more risk averse. There's studies that show this. You know, older people tend to be more risk averse than younger people. So if I offered the same bet to your father, your grandfather, and if your grandfather's, my guess is you'd probably see them pay less for the same investment because they're more risk averse. That's what risk aversion means. But let's extrapolate from there. There are parts of the world. So if older people demand bigger risk premiums because they're more risk averse. Let's see if we can extend this to some re real life scenario. I mean, there are parts of the world, as we talked about last, last session, which are aging, Europe, Japan. As investors age, what should happen to risk premiums in markets? Then? They should go up. As risk premiums go up, what should happen to stock prices? They have to go down, right? When one goes up, the other goes up. Yep. There is only one market. I mean, there is, when you talk, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Every market, you get more risk averse. You charge a bigger spread for risk. You will pay lower prices. It doesn't matter. 
doesn't matter, right? Because stocks, bonds, if, you know, you're assuming that we're talking about risk free. I'm talking about corporate bonds. If there is risk and you charge a higher price, you'll pay a lower. So something to think about, right? When you think about equity risk premiums around the world and what can happen to them over time, as people age, risk premiums go up. Now I'm gonna come back to you. You said you were willing to pay $30, right? Let's say that we wake up tomorrow to a crisis. God help us, let's hope this is not really true. The crisis could be a new virus has shown up somewhere. Okay. Please God, not true. It could be an economic crisis. It could be a political crisis. There are parts of the world you wake up and you're... So you were willing to offer $30 before this happened, right? Would you offer less or more now that I've told you about this crisis? Less, right? Everybody agree with that? If you have a crisis, the only thing you can adjust is the price, right? You can't go in and adjust the future cash flows. So you pay less. So what happens during crises? Prices drop and risk premiums go up. Today, I'm going to show you what happened to the equity risk premium for the US equity market by day during 2020. To do that, I've got to come up with a way of estimating risk premiums by day. And you're going to see the risk premium move in ways that make intuitive sense, but you can also see how much they can move. Yeah. If there's an investment that's risk-free, and then there's a crisis and it remains a risk-free investment, uh, would the price go up? Perhaps you'd be willing to pay more for the risk. So basically risk-free rates might come down. And that's what I think he was talking about. And that, that the risk-free rate can come down, but risk premiums always go up because in a sense, you're scared. That's a flight to safety. And people talk about flight to safety. That's basically what it is. Yeah. So hold on to that thought because today we're going to devise a way of getting out of what I call the historical risk premium trap. Okay. Before I do that, though, let me complete the cycle of what I started with equity risk premiums by country. Do you remember the page I showed you? By, oh, actually, let me I have to reshare this, otherwise it won't work. Sorry about that. Okay, so these are the equity risk premiums by country. Before I go any further with this, I hit you with this at the very end of the class. Are there any questions you have about how I approach estimating equity risk premiums by country. <laughs> I mean, it, it, clearly I made assumptions, I can be wrong, but at least you could see the pathway I adopted. You know, yeah, go ahead. How did I get the Caribbean? I actually broke it down. If you go to my website, I actually break it down by, the, I ran out of space on the page, but I actually have each part of the Caribbean, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, you know, basically you can see each, each country separately. That's a weighted average. In fact, I should mention, I'm glad you brought this up. See, I have a regional equity risk premium. The way I computed that regional equity risk premium is I took a weighted average of the equity risk premiums of all of the countries in the region. You're saying weighted by what? By GDP. And here's my logic. If I'm computing the equity risk premium for Asia, it's silly to weight Vietnam and China equally because China is so much larger than Vietnam. This is a GDP weighted average. So you ready? Here's the next part. So this is my equity risk premium by country. I come to you with a company. You pick the company, so take the company you pick. You have, very, you have very few companies that operate only in the domestic market anymore. You might have a company which operates only in the market, but many companies operate in multiple countries. So I'm gonna start off asking, what do we do to get equity risk premiums by country, by, for a company which is in many markets? So let me lay out the three ways in which it's done. One of which I don't, I don't think we should do, but a lot of analysts adopt this approach. The first one, you take every company in a country and give it the same extra country risk premium. So if it's a Brazilian company, every Brazilian company gets a Brazilian equ country equity risk premium. Every Indian company gets Indian equity risk premium. So your equity risk premium is based on where you're incorporated and listed, not based on where you do business. The second is to bring in the equity risk premium into the analysis and say, I'm gonna scale it by the beta of the company. High beta companies, because they're more volatile, will be more exposed to country risk. And in the third approach, I'm actually gonna keep the country equity risk premium separate and concoct 
this measure called lambda. You notice the word I use. I didn't say derive because it's just deep thought. I concocted, and I'll give you the history of this concoction. But the lambda now becomes your my your my way of measuring how exposed you are to country risk. But in doing all of this, there's a fundamental question that we want to address. When you look at the risk of a company, should you look at where it's based or should you look at where it does business? To me, the answer seems obvious. But in practice, 75%, perhaps more of all valuations, base it on where you're incorporated. So emerging market companies get the equity risk premium. The US companies all get the US equity risk premium. I think that's plain wrong because your risk comes from exposure. And that's basically what we're going to work on is how do we come up with that operations-based equity risk premium? What do we use to wait? And we look at the choices and you see the choices I made and I'll try to justify it, but I don't claim to have the final answer here. You might come up with a more creative way of waiting. The simplest way, the one that I use most often is to weight equity risk premiums by how much revenues you get in each country. I'll take two examples. Now, the first one, if you look at, uh, you know, you look at Embraer, Embraer broke its revenues down into revenues from Brazil, which is 3%, and the revenues from the rest of the world. They, but they're mostly US mature markets because Embraer sells aircraft. You've been on an Embraer jet, Usually we take these short flights, you know, from here to, I don't know, upstate New York, in this tiny jet, you might or might not make it. It's probably an Embraer jet. It makes corporate jet, it makes, it makes aircraft for smaller, a smaller aircraft. It sells, at least in, in 2004, when I did this, it sold 97% of its aircraft outside Brazil. So one way to do this is to take a weighted average. 97% comes from outside Brazil. Take a weighted average equity risk cream of every country other than Brazil. 3% comes from Brazil. And you come up with an equity risk premium for Embraer. You think that's very broad to put the rest of the world. Here's a more expanded breakup. If you take Embev, which is also a Brazilian company, but it's a, now a Latin American beverage company. It used to be primarily Brazil, but it's now kind of spread out. Its revenues come from not just all of Latin America, it has a Canadian revenue stream. That's a percentage of revenues it gets from each of those. Take a weighted average based on the equity risk. You get an equity risk premium for the company. We pause right there though. First, why do you think I'm using revenue weights? I mean, you could have used operating income weights, net income weights, asset weights. Beggars can't be choosers. You know why I use revenue weights? Because that's often the only variable companies break down by region. So it's not as if you have a dozen different choices. This might be your only choice. The second is a little more subtle. If let's say I decide to use, let's say your company breaks revenues, uh, you know, operating income down by region. You know what's, what's uh, scary about operating income? It can be negative for some parts of the world. You could be losing money. You think, so what? What happens to weight then if you use a negative number? You'd come up with a negative weight for that part of the world and you know, more than 100% for the rest, which makes absolutely no sense. You're not selling short on Latin America just because you're losing money there. So I use revenue weights knowing fully well that there are weaknesses with doing that. We'll talk about what those weaknesses are because for many companies, I don't have a choice. Here's the other thing that you got to live with. When you, try, when you look this up for your company, and most, if you look at the company's annual report, you'd see this breakdown somewhere in the footnotes. Some of you are going to be frustrated with how your company breaks revenues down. US companies are among the biggest culprits. You know how most US companies break their revenues down by? We get 61% of our revenues in the US, 39% in, the rest of the world. Come on, guys. This is a really big place you're talking about. I'd like to know, is the rest of the world Brazil or is it Europe? You can't fight that fight and win because this is all they provide. You've got to do the best with what you're given. And if your company breaks revenues down that way, you've got to come up with an equity risk premium and hope and pray that these aren't in the most risky parts of the world. 
In some cases, companies who break the revenues down, not by country, but by region. You look at Coca-Cola, it has too many countries. So to give it, you know, to, in its defense, rather than break every country down, which would be like 75 countries, they break it down into the Europe, Middle East, North America. So basically what you have to then do is that's where the regional averages come in. You can put in the regional averages and come up with an equity risk premium for your company. You got to live with the data you have. And in some cases, make the best judgments you can. So since we're talking about Coca-Cola, there's a breakdown. They break it down regionally. They don't break it down by company. I take the equity risk premium. So this is in 2012. I take that weighted average for the region. Just to make sure your revenue weights add up to 100%, right? Across the world. That's a mathematical requirement. That's the only one that you need to meet. And you can come up with an equity risk premium for Coca-Cola. The way I describe this is we live in a world of multinationals that through the accident of history happen to be incorporated and traded in different parts of the world. So we think of Vale as a Brazilian company, Coca-Cola as a US company. At some point, you've got to give up that, that notion of where companies incorporate and think about where it does business. Any questions? What can use revenues be negative? Accounting can do some very creative things, right? That's the advantage of revenues. Revenues can be zero, but they can never be negative, right? That's the problem. Anytime you go below revenues, you can get negative numbers, but revenues can never be negative. Can I ask a question from Zoom? Yep. So um, just to confirm, this would mean that if you have a company in, I don't know, you know, Argentina who does business in, I don't know, Europe, some parts, some countries in Europe, say I don't know, Germany for some reason, you would take basically take a weighted average yep. of the equity risk premiums from based on the portion of revenue that you'd be doing, you'd be getting. That's, uh, exactly, that's exactly right. And uh, is, there, is there a reason that might bother you? Is that is there is there? You picked no, out that's not, no. I was just confirming the concept, but that, that's what that. But I'll tell you why it would bother me. I, mean, I actually value an Argentine company whose business it is to grow lemons. That's it. I forget the name of the company. It was a few years ago. And it gets 70% of its revenues outside Argentina. In fact, it gets a lot of revenues from Europe. You know why? Because of the fact that it's on the, it's in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's in summer. And so they actually sell lemons to Italians who need lemons to make their pasta sauce or whatever they need to make. So when I value the company, I did factor in that they get a big chunk of their revenues outside Argentina. But as I did that, and it's a good launching pad for why revenues can sometimes be tricky, all the lemons are grown in Argentina, right? The fact that they get set, let's say it's 100% of your revenues in Italy, right? My, with my approach, I'd give them the Italian equity risk premium. The only problem is the lemons are all still grown in Argentina. Your production is still in, Arge in Argentina. Just like Embraer's aircraft production is all in Brazil. And by focusing on revenues, sometimes you can argue that maybe you're missing risks that come from where you produce the goods. If you're a manufacturing company, the factories being in a country can expose you to risk by focusing on revenues I could miss. It. But I'll tell you the companies where I worry about this the most. If you're a mining company, your country risk is kind of locked in, right? You're the Nigerian oil company. I mean, if you're a software company in India and you don't like the way India is going, you know what you can do? You can uproot the entire company and move it to a different part of the world, fly out all your software engineers, you know? put it in the cloud, do whatever you need to do. But if you're a Nigerian oil company you don't like the way Nigeria is going as a country, what the heck are you going to do? Take all your oil reserves and put them in the middle of Switzerland? That'll make your risk go down, but it's not doable. So when you focus on revenues, you might be missing that production part. So you think, what do I do then? It's common sense, right? If you're worried about where the production is, not the revenue, then maybe that's what you should be using to weight equity risk premium. So valuation I did of Royal Dutch in 2015. Royal Dutch, as you know, is an oil company. And if you're an oil company, 
there's really no risk you face in where you sell your oil because you sell it to a global oil market. Your risk almost entirely comes from where you extract the oil. And you know where most of the oil in the world is? This is a, I think God sits there and this is his big trick on the world. You know what? I'm going to put oil in the most risky parts of the world. Or conversely, the minute I put oil into that part of the world, it becomes part of the most risky parts of the world. And guess what? If you look at uh, Royal Dutchess, and they actually break it down in there. So I didn't have to do any digging for this. This was in their annual report. This is the gas and oil production by country. And I've taken a weighted average of the equity risk premiums based on production. So for most companies, I use revenue weights because I have no choice or because I believe revenues best reflect exposure. But for some companies, I'll use production weights. And for still others, there's no reason why you can't use both, right? There's, you know, when, when I said use, you can then create some weight of how much should come from revenues and how much from production. You're saying it's a tech company, it doesn't have factories. You know where most of Microsoft software is now written? It's written in India. It's not written in Washington State. That's something you should be factoring in when you think about valuing Microsoft. I don't think it's as big an issue as having your factories in India because it's a little more mobile, but it still exposes them to country risk. I don't have the answer, but I want you to be creative. I want you to think about country risk based on where a company has its operations and then think about how do I bring it into my analysis? Now, in very, very special cases, I try to separate out country risk, especially if it's a company with a single country that I'm worried about, and try to estimate how exposed the company is to country risk. I'll tell you the, I told you I concocted this approach. I'll tell you the, the circumstances under which it was concocted. It was in 2003 or four, I was flying to Brazil to do a valuation seminar. At that time, I was doing what analysts were all doing, which is take all Brazilian companies, give them all the Brazilian equity risk premium, come up with a high cost of equity, value the company. And the two companies I was valuing were Embraer and Embev. At that time, Embev got almost all of its revenues in Brazil. And Embraer, as you can see, got 97% of its revenues outside Brazil. In fact, I had the annual report for uh, for Embraer, I was looking through the annual report. I see this pie chart, tiny sliver in Brazil, 97% of the rest of the world. I happened to have the annual report for Boeing with me. Don't ask me why. And I looked at them, they had a pie chart and I set the two pie charts next to each other. I couldn't tell them apart. Here I was attaching a US equity risk premium to Boeing because it was US incorporated and a Brazilian equity risk, but they were getting revenues from pretty much the same parts of the world. And I said, this is not fair. I shouldn't be treating Embev and Embraer equivalently because Embev gets so much of its revenues in Brazil, it's much more exposed to risk than, and I have to find a way to bring that difference. in. So I concocted a measure and I called it Lambda. You know why? If you ever concoct a measure, give it a Greek letter. There's a reason these COVID guys are playing with the Greek alphabet. It's a history that goes back a long time. You take a concept, you attach a Greek alphabet, it adds a layer of sophistication to it that makes it difficult to plumb what exactly is going on. And if I told you, it's a beta, we called it B. It'd be a lot more, lot less intimidating, right? I called it beta all of a sudden. The only people who are not intimidated by this are the Greeks. They said, what the heck are you doing stealing our alphabet and using it in all kinds of things? I called it Lambda. And I said, here's how I see Lambda playing. This is on the long plane flight. Okay. If you're a company that's more exposed to Brazilian country risk, you should have a high Lambda. Company that's less exposed, you have a low Lambda. I land in Brazil. I think I landed at five o'clock at a 9, 9 a.m. session in Sao Paulo. If you ever taken that a car from the airport to Sao Paulo, this takes like 16 hours. It's like, you, know, you might as well walk. I think I was two hours late getting there. And then during the course of the session, I throw out this idea. I said, you know what? I should be giving Embraer a low lambda and 
and Beba Highlander. And some dummy in the classroom asked me the question that I wish that nobody would ask. It's a really good question though. He said, how exactly do you plan to estimate this Lambda? And I said, I haven't thought about that yet, but I have a long flight back. And I'll think about it then. In fact, on that flight, and I had enough time, I actually wrote a paper that's on my website that you can download, which basically is about how exactly do you estimate Lambda? And I started by listing what are the things you might think about when you think about what drives Lambda? I'd look at the revenues, obviously. I'd look at where your production is. I'd look at what risk management products you use. Maybe you've been shorting it. And after I've looked at all of this, I will come up with a way of estimating Lambda that incorporates all those factors. Much richer way than just focusing on revenues. In fact, one of the ways that one very simplistic way that's based just on revenues that you can use to get a Lambda is let's assume that I give you two Indian companies, Tata Motors and TCS. They're both part of the same family group. Tata Motors in 2008-9 got about 91% of its revenues in India. Tata Consulting Service, which is an outsourcing firm, a software firm, gets about 8% of its revenues. They're both Indian companies. They're both part of the family group. And I want to come up with lambdas that reflect that exposure. So I computed the average percentage of revenues that Indian companies get from India. So I took all the big Indian companies. I looked at the percent of revenues for each one. It's easier to do now because your databases that give that, but then I had to do it by hand. And the average Indian company in at the time that I did this got about 80% of its revenues in India. You see where I'm going to go next? I take Tata Motors, 91% of the revenues, you divide by the 80%, you get a Lambda of 1.14. You take Tata Consulting Services, 8% in revenues divided by... So basically with each company, I'm estimating a Lambda that reflects where they do business based on revenues. But I also told you that this approach based on revenues is limited. I'd, I'd love to use something more composite, something that reflects not just revenues. So here's the second try, and it's, it's, you know, it looks intimidating, but kind of hang in there. What am I trying to measure? How exposed is my company to country risk, right? You know how we estimate betas, right? We're on a regression of returns in a stock against returns in a market index. What does that tell you? How sensitive is my stock to the market? If I ran a regression of returns on my stock against some measure that moved with country risk, something that went up or down with country risk, I'd get something like a beta, but it'll be me a measure of how exposed I am to country risk. What I used was, was a return on a, a, I found a bond called a C bond, which is a Brazilian dollar denominated bond. So think about what happens if country risk goes up in Brazil, that bond drops, the returns become negative. Brazil does well. So basically what I did was I ran a regression of returns on Embraer against returns on that C bond. Just like a beta regression, you get a slope, right? That slope tells me how sensitive my stock is to how the country risk is doing in that bond. So if I get a low number, I'm less sensitive. A high number, it's more sensitive. I took Embraer and I got a slope of 0.27. Hang in there. For every 1% movement in the Brazilian C bond, Embraer moves only 0.27%. My lambda for Embraer is 0.27. It's only 0.27 times as risky as the average stock. I picked a different Brazilian company, com company called Embrato, which was then a monopoly phone company for Brazil. Talk about a company that's locked into country risk, right? Because you don't get a choice of going across countries. Their lambda, when I ran this regression, was 2.00. And no, you're stretching because you're using returns. There's a lot of noise. But if you're thinking about lambdas and you think about country risk exposure, this is a more complete measure because you're looking at how the entire company's market cap moves as the country goes up and down. I also told you that I use this only in a very small subset of companies, and I'll explain why. Let's say you, you like this lambda approach. It looks more sophisticated, right? You decide you're going to use this when you value Coca-Cola. How many countries did I say Coca-Cola was in? Like 75 countries. You know what you'd have to do to use this approach for Coca-Cola? You'd have to get a lambda for each country. Talk about nightmare scenarios. You're, you're going to see, I think, one out of the 40 companies you're going to see me value in this class. 
I'll use a lambda. The remaining 39, I'm going to use a much simpler approach, which is just take a weighted average of the equity risk premiums and move on. Because I'm saying, look, I don't have the time or the inclination to get a lambda by country or region. It's just way too much work. Now, will it matter how I estimate the, absolutely, the cost of equity that I get for Embraer can be very different depending on which of the many approaches I've described you. So in fact, I'm gonna give you five different approaches that you can use to get a cost of equity for Embraer. The numbers are gonna be different, but I'd like you to group them, low numbers versus high numbers. Which are the approaches that give you the lower numbers, which are going to give you the high numbers? The first approach, I do what lazy analysts do. Brazilian company, I'm gonna add this, at, at the time that I did this, Brazil was an incredibly risky country. It's extra country risk premium on top of the US premium was 7.89%. The US premium was about 5%. So the first approach, because I'm punishing it for being a Brazilian company, I end up with this cost of equity of 17.24%. In fact, if I bring the 7.89% into the brackets and do, uh, a weighted average equity risk premium, I come up with a much lower premium. In fact, if you look at the five approaches, any approach where I'm punishing Embraer for being a Brazilian company and not bringing in the fact that it gets most of its revenues outside Brazil, I come up with high numbers, right? 16, 17, 18%. But if I do incorporate the effect, I mean, depending on the approach, I get nine, 10, but much lower cost of equity. Anytime you have an emerging market company with significant exposure to developed markets, Embraer in Brazil, Infosys in India, you're going to get this divergence between what you get as a cost of equity by just treating it as an Indian company or a Brazilian company and what you get as a cost of equity by bringing in where it gets revenues. There's a, play, there's a reason I'm kind of emphasizing this. But I want to first make sure everybody gets the mechanics of why this is happening. Because if I take an emerging market company, I punish you for being in that emerging market, even though you get 90% of its rev your revenues outside, you are going to end up with a high cost of equity. And I said, most people use this location-based approach, which means people, if they're valuing Embraer or they're valuing TCS, they're valuing Infosys, are using much higher costs of equity then I'd be using. So let's, let me follow up on this. If you take that to this logical limit, companies in emerging markets with significant exposure to developed markets like in priority, you're gonna get a bigger difference between your cost of equity. So for 2004, as I said, the cost of equity that other analysts might be using is 17 to 18%. And you think, or at least I think, based on my reasoning, that it should be really 10 to 11%. So you know what, what we're going to find, right? If they're actually valuing the companies and pricing them on that basis, I'm going to come up with a much higher value for Embraer than they are. I would say about seven or eight companies in my overall portfolio are built around this premise that these companies routinely get undervalued because of the way people approach their valuation. I'd be crazy to just go buy these companies randomly. So here's what I do. I have a list of two or three companies like this in every market that I'm interested in. So I already have listed for Brazil, companies like Embraer, Natura, which is a cosmetics company. I have that list ready and I wait for a crisis in that market. You're saying, what if there's no crisis? I, it's not a question of whether, it's a question of when, there's always a crisis that hits these markets. Something will happen, political, economic. And when there's a crisis, what happens? People panic. They sell everything, good stuff, bad stuff. Embraer gets sold, Embraer gets sold. They all get knocked down because they're Brazilian companies. I have a limit by put in because if I have to make the decision myself, I'll probably give you two, cowardly to actually make the decision because it's tough to buy a Turkish company when the Tur Turkey is melting down. Those seven or eight buy companies in my portfolio were buys that happened after a crisis, but that's something I wanted to think about. You know, think about you know, whatever market you're interested in, think of the one or two standout companies in the market that get the bulk of their revenues outside the country. Because there will be a time where those companies get misvalued because I think people are are basically valuing these companies too broad a brush. Any questions? However, to make money, 
what has eventually happened? There's got to be a correction. The market has to be. That's the wild card here, right? Because you might have to wait. I mean, I bought Embraer. You know, this is a long time. It shows you how long ago it was. It was when Lula got elected as president, what, 2002 or three? And I know it's 2002. And remember at the time that he got elected, you're too young to remember, people were just completely freaked out. So socialist has become the president, he's going to nationalize everything, sell everything in Brazil and leave. Everybody you know, was, was selling. Uh, that's when I bought him, Brar. Okay? So in a sense, that's the kind of crisis. Right now in Chile, you're seeing a mini version of this crisis play out because for those of you familiar with Latin American politics, Chile is a new president a very different president than the presidents of run Chile so far. And there are people who are freaked out about it. So maybe this might be worth saying on Chile, what would be the equivalent of Embraer? I know I, the, the Chilean companies I know of are, are not quite like Embraer, but there should be some, it's, copper, it's a com country built on copper mining, right? Some of its biggest and most valuable companies are copper mining companies. That's a goose that lays the golden egg. No socialist is going to nationalize these companies because without copper being exported, that's a big chunk of your foreign exchange. So maybe one of those copper mining companies where 95% of your revenues come from outside Chile would be the company that's getting knocked down because of it. No? But as I said, you find out only by looking. You had a question, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, well, I was going to ask, and then now I look up the stock market. Well, it's a, it's had three stock splits, so you can't look at the stock price itself. Oh, okay. So basically, it's yeah. yeah, so basically, if it's not to split adjusted, you cannot. I mean, I, I held Embraer for a long time. So basically, that's, that's the trigger that drives it. You look for a crisis, you buy it at the price you can, and then hold on for as long as you can. Any questions about country risk? Go ahead. So does this approach not consider at all uh, the risk of the country that's incorporated? Like you ignore? No, it does. If you have the production part, it will show up, right? So to the extent that if you ignore the production part completely, it will miss that country risk. Should you do everything abroad, but there's still a risk of nationalization or regulation at home? Well, only if you have physical facilities, right? It's very difficult to nationalize a software company. If 100% of your revenues outside, are outside the country, what exactly are you going to nationalize, right? Nationalization works better for big infrastructure, big physical asset companies. Okay. You know, there are a lot of Israeli companies that are Israeli only in name. They've got a shingle hung up in Tel Aviv, but they sell their products and services primarily in the U.S. They're pharmaceutical companies. You know, it's, if you have SodaStream, you know, it, it, it was an Israeli company, got almost all of its revenues from the U.S. when it was founded. So again, what I'm saying is those companies, na nationalization is not even an option because so much of what you do, there's no physical asset that anybody can take over. Any, qu any other questions? Yes. How would you respond to using this model to like really abrupt changes? Well, were there unexpected abrupt changes or yeah, expected? Unexpected. Well, what do you do about any unexpected abrupt change? Go back to your model. You adapt the best you can. You revalue the company with the change built in. Yeah? That's, that's part of the risk you can't control. There will be things that happen that are out of your control. So if an Embraer jet develops serious production problems, none of this analysis is really going to protect you, right? Because ultimately, you, got, you can't sell your aircraft anymore. It's like the 737 MAX, right? It completely gets pulled up. So those are things you just, I mean, that's going to be true for any kind of unexpected change. you got to adapt and make the best you can. Now let's talk about the other way of thinking, because everything I've done so far is built on that historical premium, right? Because, and, I, and as I said, the historical premium for the U.S. is not a very reliable number. So at least I want to start thinking about a different way of coming up with equity risk premiums. So let's go through that exercise. Rather than think about what a company or, or no, what, what people tell you they want to make as an equity risk model in the past, what you pay for stocks is a better indicator of what you can expect to make in the future. So the, the, the relationship between stock price and risk premiums is inverse. Prices go down, risk premiums go up. Prices go up, risk premiums go down, holding all else constant, cash flows. Of course, all else is not always constant, so we'll have to adjust for that. 
an implied equity risk premium, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm saying, you tell me what you pay for stocks. I'm going to try to back out of that what kind of return you must be expecting to make because the price gave you away. So I'll, I'll, I'll go back to a very early estimate of the implied equity. I've been doing this for, I think, since the 1990s. January 2008, there's a reason I'm picking 2008 as my starting point for this assessment. That was the start of the year in which, of course, we had the big meltdown. But coming into the year, nobody saw it coming. So you can think of this as a change that nobody expected. I wanted to compute an implied equity risk premium or the equity risk premium for the US. So I took the S&P 500. At the start of 2008, the S&P 500 was at 1,468.36. Now, in fact, to understand what I'm going to do, you know how you compute the yield to maturity in a bond? You do. Don't act like, you know, I've never heard of that. Somebody help me. How do you compute the yield to maturity in a bond? Do you have what do you do? What do you start with? First, you start with the price of the bond, right? And then you take the coupons and the face value on the bond, and you solve for that discount rate that makes the present value of your cash flows equal to the price of the bond today. So you to maturity in the bond. It's like an IRR for a bond. I'm going to do something analogous with stocks. Instead of buying a bond, you bought the S&P 500, right? 1468.36. Instead of coupons, what do you hope and pray you will get as cash flows? Dividends. Dividends. And in the US, an increasing number in the form of buybacks. I projected out the expected dividends and buybacks for the next five years. You're saying, what happens after year five? These are the 500 largest market cap companies in the US. They can't keep growing at a rate faster than the economy. So the end of year five, guess what I do? I put that cash flow in as growing at the risk-free rate. I've already talked about how the risk-free rate is expected growth plus the expected. So I'm using that principle. So I have the price, I have the expected cash flows forever. What's the one thing that's unknown? I don't have a discount rate. I solve, so it's like a year to maturity for stocks. It's a little messier because you can't use the IRR function on Excel because the cash flows are changing and the term and value will be different. I use the solver function itself. The solver function basically says, this is the discount rate that will make the present value of the cash flows equal. And if I use the solver function, the number I got at the start of 2008 was 8.39%. You're saying, what does that even mean? If you bought US stocks at the start of 2008, I don't care what you hoped you would make, what you prayed you would make, what you thought you would make, given what you paid for those stocks, you can expect to make 8.39% a year. You see why it's forward looking? Because what am I basing it on? What you pay to the expected cash flows in the future. It's dynamic. Why? Because every time the price changes, the premium changes. I can compute it by minute every day if I wanted to, because every time the index changes, the cash flows might not every minute, but the price will change. And if I subtract out the risk rate, which T bond rate then was 4.02%, my implied equity risk premium at the start of 2008 was 4.37%. Start. So entering in 2008, if you ask me, what's the equity risk premium for the US? I'd have said 4.37%. One year later, I'm going to show you the premium. And it's shockingly different. You know why, right? 2008 was a very unusual year. I'll go back and delve deeper into 2008. So this is one year later. I do exactly the same thing. I take the level of the index at the start of the year, and guess what it's now? 903.25. Do you remember what it was one year ago? 1,468. Work out in your head what that means for stocks over the year. You went from 1,468 to 903. This was a horrifically bad year. I take that index level, 903. I do exactly what I did, but now notice the cash flows have also dropped. Why? Because you're now in a crisis. People have become more pessimistic about the future. At the end of year five, I did exactly what I did last time, but now the risk-free rate has dropped to 2.21%. So my growth rate also decreases because I'm more pessimistic about the future. Same process played through. The expected return I get is 8.64%. So after this, no, this year of monumental change, 
it looked, looks like not much happened to my expected return in stocks. It went from 8.39 to 8.64. But if you look at the difference between that and the T-bond rate, my equity risk premium, which used to be 4.37%, has jumped to 6.43%. That's a pretty horrifically bad jump for a mature equity market in one year. Clearly something happened in 2008. We know exactly what happened. And here's what I did. I went in and looked at the equity risk premium by day from September 12th of 2008 through December 31st of 2008. I mean, you're, you're all too young to remember September 12th of 2008 was a Friday. In fact, uh, I don't know whether September 12th was a Friday. It was a week. Uh, the, the, it was a Friday before the big crash. Okay? I remember I was on the train going back home at 3.30 in the afternoon. Why was I going back at 3.30 in the afternoon? Because I go home whenever I feel like it. I come in whenever I feel like it. It was just one of those days. And as I was going home, I was reading a news story that said that Lehman was in trouble, but they were close to a deal with Barclays. But my reaction was company specific problem. Monday morning, Lehman might be down. What's the big deal? And of course, I woke up. We all woke up on Monday to a collective nightmare. It was the start of the crisis. So when you look at the equity risk from the start of the crisis, it's about 4.37%. Not much happened to the equity risk from between January 1st, of 2008 and September 12th. And then all heck breaks loose. Every day, from September 12th to December 31st, I recomputed the equity risk premium. If you're asking how much can happen in a day, you weren't around in 2008. These were days where the market would be up a thousand points by midday and be down 2000 points at the end of the day. Huge swings over the course of a day. So every day the index is moving, I'm re-estimating the equity risk premium. People are freaking out, they're getting scared. So guess what they're doing? What you did which is when I'm scared, I'm gonna knock down the price. The index is going down, the premium is climbing. There was a day in November where the implied equity risk premium in the US exceeded 8%. You know what terrified people about 2008? This was not supposed to happen in mature equity markets. In fact, what separated mature from emerging equity markets is in markets like Brazil or India, you can have crazy things happen. Premiums can double, they can have. Mature markets, premiums don't move that much. But in those three months, you felt like the bottom had fallen out. The line, I still, still tell people that until 2008, what a dividing line between emerging and developed markets. 2008, that line kind of went away and it's never come back. We now have this gray area in the middle, but on any given day, you could have a mature market behaving like an emerging market. By the end of the year, it was back down to 6.43%. This is what happens during a crisis and it shouldn't surprise us. So let me bring you up to date. January 1st of 2020, there's the equity risk premium again. I won't bore you, by the, but you're seeing the same process. I take the index, I take the cash flows. I come up with an expected return of 7.12%. That number has come down over the... But risk-free rates were at 1.92%. You take the difference. My implied equity risk premium at the start of 2020 is 5.2%. And then... COVID hits. February 14th of 2020 was the day that the Italian government said that they'd found, until February 14th, people don't remember, and maybe you do. This was supposed to be on cruise ships and China, right? We had consigned it very conveniently. This is, you know what, it's not coming here. February 14th, what woke us all up to the fact that this wasn't going away and it was coming everywhere was until then every case had been traced back to some exposure somewhere, either because you were, you know, you'd gone to Asia, you'd been with somebody. These were 200 people in Italy with no exposure, at least that nobody, that anybody could figure out, who had now had COVID. And we woke up to a nightmare where essentially over the next six weeks, the S&P 500 lost 35% of its value. And starting in 2008, one of the practices I've gone into is every time 
we go into a crisis, I start computing equity risk premiums on a daily basis. It's for my own sanity. Because if I watch CNBC during those times, I'm going to do some really crazy things. So I turn off the TV and say, I want to find my own level of balance. So I want to figure out what's going on. And guess what? Between February 14th of 2020 and March 23rd of 2020, the equity risk premium did exactly what you saw happen in 2008, went through the roof. In fact, the equity risk premium went from 4.7% to almost 8%. March 23rd, it looked a lot like 2008, right? But here's where no two crises are ever the same. Take a look at what happened after you peak. March 23rd, the world was ending. World was ending, at least according to the experts. They said, sell everything, this is it. Thank God I didn't listen. Thank God a lot of people didn't listen because over the rest of the year, guess what the equity risk premium said? They came down and they just didn't come down. They came down to levels lower than they were before the crisis, which I think is one of the great mysteries. Most crises, equity risk premium peak and then they come down, but they stay higher than they were before the crisis because people stay scared. Something about COVID and the crisis it created, at least in financial markets, the fear went away very quickly. By September 2020, we were back to where we were in February 2020, and we kept going down. You can't do this with a historical premium, but with an implied premium, day to day, you can see it more. So what does it look like at the start of 2022? The S&P is now at 4,766. Right? This is the start of this year. There are my expected cash flows. Again, I take the dividends and the buybacks from the most recent year. And the way I get expected cash flows, it's kind of tough to do this from scratch, right? One of the nice things about the S&P 500 is the most tracked and followed index in the world. There are actually a few analysts who track and estimate earnings for the entire index. So these are not estimates from individual companies. They're people who track and follow the index. There are about a dozen of them, mostly in New York. In fact, one of them, you know, the publishes every week the updated estimates for the next two years. And he actually gives you the consensus estimates for all analysts looking. So I take the growth rates from those analysts, and that opens you up for some criticism because you're saying analysts can be wrong. I will come back and talk about now. I can't estimate the growth rate, just way too much work for me to build up from the bottom up. But the growth rate you're seeing there comes from looking at what analysts are projecting for the next two years and beyond. So the start of 2022, 4,766 is the index level. Expected cash flows for the next five years and beyond. And by now it's like you're doing the same thing over and over with different sets of numbers. The expected return on stocks is 5.75%. Remember what it was at the start of 2008? 8.39%. After the crisis was 8.6%. Even as the start of 2020, it was 7.64% or whatever it was. It's now 5.75 percent. If in 1986 I'd gone to a portfolio manager, an equity portfolio manager, said, would you invest in stocks if you thought you could make 5.75 percent a year as an annual return? You know what the answer would have been? Are you crazy? You know why it would have been crazy? Because you could make seven percent investing in T bonds. What's changed? The T bond rate is 1.51 percent. 5.75% is low, I agree. But relative to the risk-free rate, it's actually delivering an equity risk premium. That's not that unreasonable. So let's say you're on CNBC. No question you're gonna get asked, right? Where do you think markets are going? This is, I tell them, don't ask me that question. I hate that question. I don't have the capacity to answer it, but they'll answer, ask it every single time. I'll give you the framework for how to think about the answer to that question. Think about the implied equity risk premium. If you think 4.24% is too low a number, that you're not making enough of a premium, what are you telling me about stocks? That they're overvalued. Because stocks have to come down to get you a higher premium. If on the other hand, you think 4.24% is a really high number, you're telling me stocks are undervalued. Every statement about markets is really a statement about implied equity risk premiums. So let's take a look at 
is that a high number? Is that a low number? Well, one way you can get a framework for answering that question is if I showed you what the implied equity risk premium has looked like for the US over the last 60 plus years. So this is what I did in, so in the four years that I showed you, think of doing this every year since 1960. That's what the graph looks like for the implied equity risk for the US. For the bulk of the 60s, the implied equity risk premium in the US was between three and three and a half percent. The US was the global equity market. Half the market cap of the world was in the US. The US economy was the center of the global economy. So equity risk premiums are low and stable. Then you get to the 1970s. Crazy things seem to be happening, right? The equity risk premium is climbing. Tell me again, as equity risk premiums cl are climbing, what's happening to stock prices? They're plunging, right? The one goes up, the other has to go down. This is the 1970s. And why is it happening? What is it about the 70s that made equity so much riskier? Inflation. Inflation. I'm glad you didn't say oil price because that's what people jumped to. That was a starting trigger was inflation. It's the first decade that US consumers and investors ever dealt with out of control inflation and it freaked them out. So what did they do? They pushed up the risk premium, pushed down stock prices. People often talk about how inflation is bad for bonds. Of course it's bad for bonds, unexpected inflation. But it's just as bad for stocks. If history is any guide, it makes equities much more risky. 1978, the implied equity risk premium in the US hit 6.5%. It's the highest implied equity risk premium in my calculation, because I've done this calculation only since 60, it's the highest since 1960. Business Week, or maybe Fortune Magazine, had an issue where the cover said, are stocks dead? Basically, they said, Equities are done as a class. And here's a lesson to take out of this. Whenever the collective financial press says it's over, that's the time you should be buying. Because if you'd gone out and bought equities at the end of 1978, you enjoyed one of the great bull markets of all time. You know how it shows up? Stock prices boomed, equity risk premiums are coming down. At the end of 1999, the implied equity risk premium in the US was 2%. Think about what I've just said. At the end of 99, what was I doing? If you're buying stocks, I said, you can make 2% more than the T-bond. What's your reaction? That's not enough. Remember what I said, if you say the equity risk premium is too low, you're telling me stock price are too high. At the end of 99, if you talked about bubbles, stock, you had ammunition, right? Look at the risk premiums, 2%. The historical premium is four or 5%. 2% is way too low. So end of 99, clearly there's a bubble. There's red lights flashing all over. But at the end of 2021, the implied equity risk premium is 4.24%. The bubblers are out in full force again. Have you noticed that? Bubble, it's going to burst any day. They've been out for a long time, but no, they're louder than usual. Now they might have a case, but if you look at the implied equity risk of 4.24%, say, is that enough? Well, relative to the long-term history, we're actually a little bit above where we should be. But that's a nuanced answer because you could say, well, the world has changed. Let me look at the last 10 years. There is worry that the premium has dropped below the last 10 year average, but this isn't 1999. So when you hear these scary stories about the world is going to melt down, stocks are hopelessly overpriced. Jeremy Grantham was reading this morning. He said, this is a super bubble. My question is what happens if it keeps going up? Does it become a super, super bubble? Is it a super, super, super bubble? Is it a super cube bubble? Stop using what like super bubble because you're setting yourself up. What do you do a year later when it's up another 20%? Based on the equity risk premium. You're in kind of neutral territory. You're a little scared, but I'll tell you the number that should scare you more. Remember that 5.75% that I showed you, the total return? That number is close to historic lows. So you know what I'm saying, right? If you think stocks are overpriced, you know what the culprit is? The T-bond rate. So if you feel the T-bond rate at 1.51% is way too low, take your issues up with the bond market. They've gone crazy. 
but you're investing in stocks based on what bond rates are. So here's how I would describe where I stand in stocks. Stocks are not unreasonably priced given the level of interest rates today. But then we talked about inflation and the potential that there could be an adjustment. That's really the big danger stocks face. Is if interest rates start to move towards three or four, or God help us, seven percent, there is no escaping that. Because even if the premium stays at four point two four percent, it's on a much bigger base. You're going to end up requiring 11, 12 percent returns on stock. That's going to create a huge knockoff of value out of stock markets. So that's the implied premium. And it's an incredibly, it's a useful device to me because people say, aren't there, you know, is there potential noise? Absolutely. I could be wrong on the growth rate. I could be wrong on, you know, the cash flows. But I'll tell you this, even if I bring in those mistakes, the standard error on my implied equity risk premium is about 0.25%. Let me repeat that again, 0.25%. So when I say the premium is 4.24%, I actually compute different measures of premium. I come up with somewhere between three and a half and 5%. As opposed to what? When we did historical premiums, remember what the standard error looked like? Even with 93 years of data, it was plus or minus four or 5%. So I agree with you, there are estimates that go into an implied premium. But those mistakes pale in comparison to the kinds of mistakes you can make with historical risk premiums. Now, here's the other thing that comes out of looking at implied equity risk premiums, the price of risk in the equity market, right? And remember when I said at the start of this class, if you get scared, you're going to demand a higher risk premium. When you get scared, you just get scared. You don't get scared just in the equity market. You just get, you're terrified. You lose your job. You're terrified. Your pension is melting down. So guess what tends to happen? There's a price of risk in the bond market as well. It's called the bond default spread. It's a spread you charge over and above the risk premium. So in this graph, what I've done is I've graphed up. The red line is the implied equity risk premium. The black line is the default spread on a BAA rated bond. So I just pick one rating class because I want you to see just direction. I'll start with the good news, at least from a, from a perspective of understanding the price of risk. Most of the time, the two move together. But there have been at least two periods in the last 30 years where the two have moved in opposite directions and it's never ended well for markets. I'll take the first one. In the late 90s, take a look at what's happening. The equity risk premiums dropping, dropping, dropping. In fact, it dropped below the bond default spread for a period in 1999. So risk premiums in equity markets are dropping, the dot-com boom and all the craziness that came with it. Default spreads are either staying constant or actually going up. At the end of 99, if I came to you and said, as an investor, you can make 2% as your default spread buying stocks, or you can make a 2% default rate buying a very safe bond. BAA rated bond is an investment grade bond. So which one would you have? You say, that's, that's a slam dunk. I'm going to go with the bond because with a lot less risk. You know how that disconnect got corrected? The dot-com bust pushed up the risk premium. You reverted back to fall. It didn't last very long. Because then you had 9-11 and Alan Greenspan saying with the hubris of central bankers, I will not let the US economy go into recession. And he engineered what's called the Greenspan put. Basically, he pumped money into bond markets, pushed default spreads down with the kind of moral suasion of the Fed. And if you look at what happened between 2002 and 2007, you can see that default spreads drop off, but equity risk premiums stay high. It's the opposite of what happened in the 90s. If I asked you, what caused the 2008 crisis? If you watch the big short, you're saying it's speculators and Goldman Sachs, or, you know, basically everybody. I'll tell you the root of the 2008 crisis was a very simple mistake. We can call it a mistake that was made in the bond market or, for, or by lenders collectively. People say it's a sub, it was because you lent to subprime borrowers. There's nothing wrong with lending to subprime borrowers if you charge them a high enough interest rate, right? You know what happened in the years leading into 2008? People lent money to people with default risk, but they forgot to charge a spread. Of course, they backed it up with all kinds of computers running saying there will not be no default here. But basically the problem was the default spreads across the board in lending markets and bond markets became too low. 
you are not charging enough of a spread. And if you're a banker, not charging enough of a spread, guess what happens? When default comes, you don't have enough fat built up to cover it. They took the economy down with them. And guess what? That's exactly what you saw happening in the 2008 crisis. Default spread shot through the roof. I mean, usually when you have big market crisis, it's the stock market guys who cause it because they do all kinds of weird stuff. 2008 was a bond market driven crisis because that's where it originated. People were charging too low a spread. I update this graph every year. You know why I do it? It takes me only three minutes to do it at the start of every year. I'm looking for, are we getting into 1990s territory or 2002? Because that movement in different directions would start to worry me because if you start to see the, one of the markets is to correct and it's never going to be good news for either market. In fact, I've computed a ratio of the equity risk premium to the bond default spread. So basically I take the equity risk, let's say it's 5%, and the BAA spread is 2%, five divided by two is two and a half. There's actually a shortcut that I can develop based on this. Across the last 60 years, that ratio has been about two. If you're in a hurry to estimate an equity risk premium, you don't want to go through the implied premium route, you don't want to use historical premiums. You know what you can do instead? The BAA spread, you can look up on Bloomberg right now. So it's actually an observable number because BAA rated bonds are traded. You can see what the spread is. Let's say the spread right now is 2.8%. I think it's actually 2.3%. If history is any guide, if the bond default spread on a BAA rated bond is 2.3%, and historically the equity risk premium has been two times that, two times 2.3%, gives you an equity risk premium of 4.6%. So if you don't like to go this implied premium route, take the default spread and just double it. It's actually not an unreasonable way or a bad way of estimating equity risk premiums if history is any guy. Let me bring one other graph into play. In this graph, I have the equity risk premium. That's a red line. I have the bond default spread in a BAA rated bond, the black line. You know what the green line is? Have any of you worked in real estate? Anybody? Did you work in real estate? Real estate, there is this number that real estate investors use called the cap rate. What's a cap rate? If I give you a building and I tell you, you, you what, what's a cap rate? It's, sorry, it's, a, it's the multiple and the net operating income of a building. Right? In other words, if I have income of a million and you say your cap rate is 10%, you pay 10 times a million, right? That's basically... A, so basically it's a income divided by that number gives you the multiple that you're willing to pay. The cap rate is very roughly speaking an expected return that you're demanding on a real estate investment. Because the higher you make that number, the lower the price you pay. So just like an equity risk premium when the cap rate goes up, you pay lower prices. When the cap rate goes down, you pay higher prices. And it's an observable number. You can actually look it up online. These are the cap rates. So what I did in this graph with the green line is I took the cap rate and I subtracted the risk-free rate from it. What am I doing? I'm just subtracting. I'm getting a risk premium for real estate based on the cap rate. And this graph tells a very strange story. Through much of the 1980s, in fact, leading into the 90s, for almost all of that period that you can compute it, if you take the cap rate on real estate and subtract out the risk-free rate, you come up with a negative risk premium. That sounds weird, right? They're actually settling for less and there's actually a reason for this. When I did my MBA, do you know what the story about real estate was? That every investor, if you have stocks and bonds in your portfolio, should try to have some real estate in your portfolio. Most Americans end up having real estate in their portfolio by doing what? When they buy a house, because the biggest part. But if you don't own a house, you are told go buy real estate securities or real estate, invest in real estate, because real estate works in the opposite direction or moves in the opposite direction as financial assets. That was the 1980s. And when you're buying real estate because it moves in the other direction as your financial assets, you know what you're doing, right? You're buying an investment with a negative beta, right? Essentially, it's a, it's, and when you have an investment with a negative beta, what kind of expected return should you expect to see? Much lower than the risk-free rate because you're buying insurance. And then too many people listen to this advice 
And Wall Street decided to make it easy for you to invest in real estate. Until 1981, if you want to invest in real estate, you actually had to go buy a building, buy an apartment. This guy called Lou Ranieri at Solomon created a group of securities called mortgage-backed securities. Essentially, it was the start of the securitization of real estate. So now you could invest $1,000 in real estate without ever building, buying a building. And it destroyed real estate as an asset class in some ways, because once you securitize something, it seems to take away its capacity to be a standalone asset. So if you look at what, what's happened since the mid nineties, real estate is starting to behave like stocks and bonds. And it has a very negative consequences. I told you about 2008, right? 2008, what did your stock portfolio do? It was down 30%. What did your bond portfolio do? Unless your T-bonds was down 15%. What did your, the price of your house do? It dropped 40% as well. If you thought your, real, you know, your house was going to hedge you against that crisis, it seemed to stop working. Real estate as an asset class is starting to behave like other financial assets. It's, it's scary because it means that you have no place to hide. Okay. Where do you think pension funds and other hedge funds didn't, don't have bad years? They have exactly the same bad years the rest of us do. You, this is uh, this entire notion of alternative assets, complete nonsense to begin with, right? And, and I'll tell you why. There are only three asset classes out there, actually four. There's stocks, there's bonds, and you can have you know different geographies. There's real assets, which include real estate and commodities, and you have collectibles, like what? Baseball cards, Picassos. Everything else is invention. So when somebody says hedge funds are a different asset class, you've got to slap them around the face and wake up. Hedge funds have to invest in something, right? You invest in stocks. You can invest in real assets, but you can't make up asset classes based on how people invest. Let's all let go of this notion. And I, I think it's a very dangerous notion that there are people on Wall Street who are smart money. There is no smart money. There's stupid money and really stupid money. There's stupid money that thinks it's smart money. And we know, how, we know you, there's very clear evidence there's no smart money. What does the average hedge fund beat the market by every year? It's minus 1%. So where's the smartness? Where does that's that's different? That's, well, that's, that's, no, that's basically it tells you something about greed, right? So there is no smart money. Everybody is exposed when you have a crisis, and what this graph tells you is there's no place to hide. Every time there's a crisis, I get very popular with my relatives, people I haven't heard from from years. Remember March of 2020, I get calls from you know my distant third cousin, fourth in in India. People keep inventing you know linkage. I'm your fifth cousin. I have no idea. I've never heard. You, right? yeah. I have my money in stocks. I'm really terrified. Where should I move my money? The answer is, it used to be that you could move your money geographically, right? And you know what's happened? The correlation across markets in crises has gone up to like 93%. During 2020, markets moved in lockstep. You could move it to other asset classes. That's gone now. Do you see why cryptos and NFTs have kind of taken off? Because people keep trying to say, and nothing existing works. Let's try to find something that is. It's a very dangerous search you're on because you're hoping to create an asset class to be uncorrelated. And incidentally, if you're in cryptos, you look at the history over the last 13 years, they behave like very risky stocks. So if you're moving your money into Bitcoin for the coming crash, I would look again, because the market is down 40%. My prediction is your Bitcoin is going to be down 60%. There's only one collectible. That stood there, and you're not going to like it because it's going to make you feel like your grandfather or your father. You don't want to invest like them. You know what that collectible is? It's gold. Gold has been the only asset class. And then we can go back and look at the history of gold and how it got here. But if you think of Bitcoin as millennial gold, which is the way I described it, it's millennial gold, which doesn't really have any track record yet. 
I mean, in fact, there are two, brand, two pathways. Bitcoin can go. It can truly become millennial gold or it can become millennial beanie babies. Remember beanie babies that people yeah, put money in? No? Pokemon cards, if that was what you put your money in. They come and they go, right? They're, they're, people say, this is it. So I think there's a lot of evidence still to come. But think about that when you think of it. So let me close with a couple of questions. If you look at the historical risk premiums, you come up with a number. And sometimes when I go into investment banks, I've, I've tried to sell people an implied equity risk premiums now for about 40 years. I'm starting to get some traction. But often you go, when I go into an investment bank and I talk about implied equity risk premiums, the head of the group says, you know, we don't have a problem here. And I said, what do you mean you don't have a problem here? He says, we all look at that Duffin Phelps or historical risk premium. We all use the same premium. You see the implicit message here, right? As long as we all use the same equity risk premium, what's the big deal? Let's play this out. Let's assume the premium you're using is 8.49%. You pick the number out of that table. That's a premium everybody uses. But the implied premium is 4.24%. If every analyst uses 8.49% in a world where stocks are being priced to deliver 4.24%, what is every valuation going to come out with as an answer? If you truly do valuation right, using a premium almost twice as high as what you should be using, every stock you try to value is going to look massively overvalued that huge discount rate lower value don't buy that don't can you imagine being an equity research analyst and every message you send to sell 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 just because you all have the same premium doesn't mean that you're protected here you still have to get a sense of what a reasonable premium is okay next session i will i know over the weekend i'll send you a paper it is uh, it is exhilarating to read actually not it's a paper I, I i update every year on equity risk premiums give it your best shot because it kind of looks at this entire it's central to everything in stocks and bonds so you get a chance read it because i think you will find it useful i'll see you on monday